Hi, everyone online. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we have some uh, two excellent talks, as always, signed up uh, today. Um, but before we get into those, I want to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, for us uh, on campus, it's the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, but I also um, want to extend that acknowledgement to um, anyone who might be coming to us from um, outside of Canberra. Um, and I also want to uh, extend that respect and um, welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in, in the room or online today, um, and also state that the sovereignty of this land was never ceded. It um, is and always will be, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, okay, so our first speaker today is Dr. Olivia Evans. Um, she was the recipient of one of the EMCR Transform Fellowships in 2022 um, that was uh, given out by SMP. Um, Olivia Evans is an Aboriginal Gumaroi woman. She was awarded a PhD in social psychology from the University of Newcastle in 2019 and is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Australian University um, within SMP. Olivia's research primarily focuses on the social determinants of health and the psychology of inclusion and exclusion. Um, today, her talk is titled Voice or Vitriol, Exploring Predictors of Support for the Voice to Parliament Referendum in Australia. And I know we can all agree it's a very um, timely uh, presentation. Um, so I'm going to just share your talk if you want to come up with. All right, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as Joe said, for those who don't know me, I'm Olivia and I'm an, um, I'm an Indigenous postdoctoral research fellow in psychology. Um, and I will be talking about some uh, research I've been doing on predictors of support of the voice. But first, I want to take a little detour to acknowledge the um, Transform Early Career Research Award I got, which I received in 2022, which allowed me to do this uh, research. So... Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the awardees of the Transform Career Development Fellowships um, for this project I pitched called Outwit, Outplay, Outclass, a large-scale longitudinal investigation of social class and health in Australia. I just like Survivor. If you think about it too hard, that title doesn't make any sense. But I was kind of hoping that Jonathan LaPaglia would come and deliver the like awarded fellowship to me. Um, it didn't happen, but I'm assuming it's just because there was like conflicting schedules and he's still in his way at some point. Um, so the pitch of the project was that um, in Australia, despite having a fairly well-developed health system, despite believing that we live in a fairly equal society where everyone's treated equally and has the same quality of life, we actually have um, a fairly uh, pronounced social gradient in health. So I have uh, this example here. In Australia, the richest 20% of the population lives an average of six years longer than the poorest 20%. Um, and that's obviously a very broad um, statistic, and there's a lot more that goes into health than just just um, lifespan and things like that, but it's a symptom of this broader trend that we have that people in, in um, lower socioeconomic conditions tend to have much poorer health outcomes across the board. Uh, and I pitched the idea that based on some of the research that I did in my PhD and since I started at ANU, um, what health research is missing in Australia is a comprehensive measure of social class. So we know now that just economic conditions, just education, those things alone aren't really telling us enough about people's lives to really explain why there's this health divide in Australia. And so um, a social class approach, which factors in things like cultural and social, as well as economic aspects of class, may help to unpack that a little bit. 
And so I proposed a comprehensive three-wave longitudinal survey, um, which included a measure of social class made by the brilliant Evans et al. 2022, um, along with a number of, that's me, by the way, uh, <laughs> along with a number of health and wellbeing related outcomes, correlates and predictors to try and track the relationship between um, this sort of more comprehensive, nuanced measure of social class and health in Australia. Um, and that's what we did. So it did take a little while to get the survey off the ground. But in um, February 2023, we collected our first wave of data, um, about 3,800 Australian participants stratified across um, different measures of SES and different um, demographics in Australia. So um, it was the panel company we used um, got a proportionate age, gender, um, metropolitan to regional areas and stuff like that, as well as things like um, education and um, income based on census data. So they tried to get um, representative portions of those people in the data set. Uh, and that's there's a lot of information in those tables, but basically what that is saying is that we managed to get that. And I just picked a few different demographics there. Uh, then three months later in May, we collected um, data from those same participants. There was about a 70% retention rate across the whole um, survey. Uh, and so then in, in July to August, like end of July, start of August, we collected our last wave of data. Um, and we have then in total uh, responses from 2,252 Australian residents um, across the three waves of the study. And um, the measures that we've included in this survey include things like general health and distress, uh, well-being measures like satisfaction with life, um, a bunch of social measures like identity, social support, social integration, healthcare satisfaction, um, self-esteem, uh, weight stigma, disordered eating, um, things like uh, vaccine hesitancy and social anxiety. It's a new uh, one. Uh, <laughs> I spelled anxiety wrong. I just realized. Um, and I, um, these measures were developed with um, a number of collaborators, including uh, Tegan Kruis, Joe Rathbone, and John Wen Chen um, from ANU, but also some international collaborators as well. Uh, so Diana Cardenas, uh, Mark Rubin, and Stefania Paolini. Um, and I tell you all of this um, to say that if any of these things interest you, especially this new anxiety thing, um, <laughs> you um, feel free to get in contact and we can um, we can discuss how you might be able to use this data and, and whether it could be relevant to your research interests. Um, but for the last, so we have this brilliant, rich data set now, um, and I'm very keen and have a lot of ideas and a lot of things in the works to look at social class and health in Australia. But this has been me for the last couple of months. Um, I, <laughs> the health and social class stuff is there, but we also included some questions around the voice um, because at the time that we were getting the survey ready to go out into the field, um, the voice was really kicking up as a social issue in Australia. We thought it was a perfect time to add in a couple of questions just to get at, some, get at what people were thinking about in terms of the upcoming voice referendum. And so that's what this talk is about today. So related to my transform, <laughs> fellowship, but sort of a little sidetrack that I've taken. So as you all know, um, hopefully the voice to parliament referendum took place a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, the referendum bill passed the upper and lower houses earlier this year, and the referendum did take place on October 14th. And it was asking um, Australians um, a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognize the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? And so obviously what we saw happen um, after the announcement of this voice is two distinct sides developed. So there was the yes um, campaign and the no campaign. Um, and I've tried to capture in the next couple of slides the main sentiment that both of these slides had um, through a few of the figureheads from those campaigns. So Linda Burney said earlier this year, it's about drawing a line on the poor outcomes from the long legacy of failed programs and broken policies and listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This voice is about making sure that what happens in the federal parliament is going to be a positive step forward, both in terms of us as a nation, but also outcomes for First Nations people in Australia. And so what uh, Linda and a lot of the uh, the dial, the um, 
the yeah, I guess dialogue behind the voice was getting at was this idea of a difference principle in governing. So um, Roll's difference principle states that a society can only claim to be just and fair when its social and economic policy improves the well-being of the most vulnerable groups in a society. And Kim Licker and Banting went one step further and said that for countries with a history of colonization, this difference principle rests on the treatment of the indigenous people of that colonized land. So when there's a history of colonization, priority must be given to ensure that indigenous rights to land, culture, language, and health and well-being are legally and politically protected in the way that that society is run. And so the voice is a key part of making sure that the most vulnerable people in society, the people who have had a um, like a system of government and a, a colonization thrust upon them are uh, given the opportunity to um, to have a say in um, to, to claim their their rights to land language culture and those kind of things um, and when they're protected in the way that the society has functioned and the voice was one of the mechanisms through which Australia was trying to achieve that. Uh, and of course, we have the no side as well. Um, I've again chosen um, a quote that I think captures a lot of the sentiment behind the no vote um, and said by evil potato himself, Peter Dutton. So changing our constitution to enshrine a voice will take our country backwards, not forwards. The voice is regressive, not progressive. This referendum on the voice will undermine our quality of citizenship. It will have an Orwellian effect where all Australians are equal, but some are more equal than others. The voice will re-racialize our nation. And so what was seen coming up in the no side of things that were barriers to achieving this difference principle, um, so acknowledged as um, ways of thinking that actively stop um, the difference principle from being activated or being uh, achieved, is first of all the myth of special privilege. Um, and this happens in a lot of different countries that have um, parallel systems and affirmative action and, um, and policies like that, like we do in Australia, but it's particularly seen in Australia through the belief that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people unfairly get more benefits than non-Indigenous Australians. So um, we saw it all the time in The Voice, but even prior to that, people believe that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people get free houses, that they can get any job that they want, um, that we get a car when we turn 18. I'm still waiting for mine, but I'm sure Jonathan LaPaglia is going to turn up with it one day. Um, and so there's this idea that we're already getting more benefits than the rest of Australians, so why should we get this extra special privilege in Parliament? And then there's also the idea of the land of the fair go. So Australians tend to hold this belief that all people can be treated the same and you can ignore differences between people in favour of the idea that everyone has individual agency and if they work hard enough in their life, um, if they do all the right things and if they conform, they can succeed. And so uh, any differences between groups of people are just from individuals not trying hard enough. And so in the present research, I wanted to investigate these ideas of fairness and justice as predictors of people's support for the referendum over the um, period of a few months leading up to the referendum. And I thought that perceptions of Australia currently being a fair society, um, so there being no need for us to change anything, um, indig and Indigenous Australians receiving special treatment um, would negatively predict support for the voice. So people who think oh, you know, Australia's already fair for everyone involved. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people already get more than they need. Um, people who believe that will be less likely to support the vote. And um, then fairness from the voice being established. So if people believe that having the voice come in will actually increase fairness in Australia and, and bring in these ideas behind the difference principle of protecting our most vulnerable groups in society, they will um, be more likely to support the voice. And so as we know, um, a couple of weekends ago, Australia said no, 41% um, voted yes, and 59% voted no. There was a um, majority no vote across all of the states. Um, and so quite firmly, uh, there will be no voice and the referendum was unsuccessful. But then, uh, interestingly, what we had happening prior to the, um, to the referendum is this huge shift 
in how people were going to vote from the start of the year to, up to when the vote actually happened. And you can see that in these polls that I've included here, that the amount of people who was going to vote yes steadily decreased over time. And this stops in July, which is around the time when we um, stopped, started, stopped collecting data as well. But it was actually looking promising at the start of the year and something shifted in the way um, people were going to vote over that period of time that we happened to be collecting data. So potentially are these variables what were what was happening then? Um, and so here's the measurements that we used. I've also tracked them across time in these little um, ugly graphs here for you to see. So um, the first, the, the main outcome measure, rather than just asking, are you going to vote yes or are you going to vote no? We ask people um, how likely they are to vote one way or the other, with a middle point being that they're, they're undecided. And that was on a scale from zero to 100. So if they voted 100, they were, if they indicated 100, they're definitely voting yes. If they said um, zero, they were definitely voting no. But we ended up getting a lot of noise, so a lot of data in the middle point as well. People weren't fully polarised either side. Um, and what you can see is that tracking with those polls earlier, uh, in, at time one, it was actually leaning towards the yes side. So it was above 50 towards 100, meaning that more than on, on average, people were leaning more towards yes. And then over the two the next two time periods, the support for the yes side dropped until at time three, it was below the 50 points. So it was leaning more towards no. And so that's a good indication that we had a representative sample in terms of how the voice was tracking over time then. Uh, then we asked people how much do you agree that the following things are true for all Australians, including people from ethnic and cultural minority groups and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So these questions are about the government being fair, the constitution, including everyone, everyone being given a fair go. Um, and interestingly, these did change a little bit over time. And I checked and um, all of these are significant from one another. Um, that tends to happen in big data sets, but it's um, not just like, uh, yeah, it's not insignificant noise in the data, it's genuine changes. And there's no difference between people who dropped out of the study as well. It's not just an effect that the people who um, were less likely to believe this dropped out over time. But so as the, um, the vote swung closer to no, people were also more likely to think, well, Australia is already a fair place. You know, the, it includes everyone, everyone's given a fair go, the constitution's fine as it is. And on the other hand, um, these questions asked people um, about fairness in the voice itself. So the, um, the voice would result in a fairer and more just Australian society, would rectify past and current injustices, give an, uh, give an unfair advantage to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which was reverse scored. And interestingly, over time, this one went down. So people started off believing that... Um, there were, the score was a bit higher, indicating that people thought that the voice would lead to a bit more fairness, and this went down over time at the same time as the voice went down. Support for the voice went down. Uh, and then we have this interesting question, which says, on a scale of 1 to 100, rate how you think Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are treated in Australia compared to most Australians. And so 0 is a lot worse than most Australians, 100 is a lot better than most Australians. And there's this interesting creep from the neutral position at time one upwards to uh, the a lot better than most Australian side. So this idea of special treatment started to creep up um, over time as well. And so all of these um, patterns in the data were in the sort of direction that we're expecting. Things are going up as the voice, um, uh, things are going up or down as the support for the voice went up or down as well. Um, and so I did have, I do have fancier statistics, um, multi-level modeling that includes time and stuff like that for this data set, but um, M plus decided that it was having a case of the Thursdays and wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't run today. Um, but I do know that the hierarchical regression I've run shows basically the same results. So I've, um, I've got these to present to you today. So first of all, time one support for the voice um, significantly predicts time three support for the voice. Um, and then um, surprisingly, current fairness in Australia, so people's perceptions of whether Australia and the Constitution is a fair, um, gives people a fair go, um, was not a significant predictor. Um, but predicted fairness of the voice was. So the more people felt like the voice was going to correct past injustices and things like that, the more likely they were to support the voice. 
And similarly, treatment for Indigenous Australians was a negative predictor. So people who, um, who thought that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people didn't receive special treatment were more likely to support the voice going forward. Uh, and then we also added in some covariates. So um, age and um, political orientation were both um, significant covariates, but gender wasn't. And the model had a fairly good fit uh, at 0.63. So what this data tells us is that the strongest predictor of support for the voice at time three was people's beliefs that the referendum would rectify past and current injustices, result in a fairer society, um, and not give an unfair advantage to Indigenous Australians. And perceptions that Indigenous Australians are currently treated equal or worse than non-Indigenous Australians was significantly predicted um, support for the voice at time three as well, but the general levels of fairness was not a significant predictor. Um, and so the implication of this is that Australians who believe the voice will improve fairness in Australia, um, who believe that it will rectify past injustices, and who see past the myth of special treatment are more likely to be voting in favour of the voice to parliament, which suggests that these are key factors to target if we want to generate support for things like the voice, um, for fulfilling the rest of the Uluru Statement, and just generally the ideas behind rules difference principle that you have to treat some, um, you have to yeah, treat some groups of people differently in order to protect the most vulnerable in society. Um, but perceptions of current fairness, not exactly sure what was going on there. Uh, it could be that people have different interpretations of fairness. The questions were quite open. Uh, one um, possible suggestion I think is that people think, well, yes, Australia is fair and that's why we're bringing in the voice. And other people think Australia is already fair and so we don't need the voice. So there was some contamination or some... Um, overlapping ideas of fairness that like hid the real effect of current levels of fairness being a predictor. Um, and so in conclusion, uh, structural adjustments are needed to create justice and fairness for Indigenous people within the political systems that have been forced upon us. And this is particularly true in Australia for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And this research shows that when people are capable of recognising that efforts like the voice are necessary to improve fairness, um, for Indigenous peoples who are currently being mistreated, then they're more likely to support it. And so efforts to change minds to support different principal approaches um, to colonial governing systems should focus on clarity around how current, uh, current and historical mistreatment are connected to these um, suggested changes, as well as the ability of these suggested changes to increase fairness in society. And I think um, looking back, that's something that the Yes campaign um, didn't do particularly well and something that the No campaign um, sort of misled people on as well. And so we can look back and see how things might have been done better there. Um, so that's it from me. Um, thank you. Amazing research. It's, you know, we're a with polling data about this, but nothing truly more than human. Um, the fact that those, study, you know, your, your predictor items changed over time, I mean, you know, they're pretty solid statements that should be stable over time. Yeah. Clearly not. To what extent do you think that that's people are using those as kind of post hoc moral justifications for? Um, you know, moving towards a, a conservative status quo by a standpoint they always want to take. But now that they've been, you know, they've been given this, they've been kind of fed through the media, oh, this is the justification I can use to it. So to what, what, what extent, I guess my question is, do you think that's a real change in people's sentiment regarding those um, items? Or to what extent do you think it's kind of a case of motivated reason? Yeah, I like it's hard to know, but I, I was surprised with how much those things moved over time because I, I was expecting the yes no um, variable to move a fair bit because it was that like huge scale and people were undecided and whatever. Um, but I think there is a case of people feel uncomfortable with change. They don't fully understand the like history of Australia and the impact of colonization on gen intergenerational trauma and stuff like that. And so they're extremely ready to be persuaded by people telling them like, 
oh, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people already get too much, like just into prices argument and that kind of thing. And so, and also to like lean more into the fact that like, oh, the constitution's fine the way it is. We don't actually need to change it. And so I think it is a case of like, I, I think a lot of, one of the things I've seen sort of unpacking the, um, the outcome of the referendum is a lot of people got easily hoodwinked just because they were like, um, they were looking for a reason not to have to change something and the no campaign gave them a better reason to not change than the yes campaign gave them reasonings for changing. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> So exciting to see this stuff live, and and um, it's like great job for fitting in the analyses in what is a really short time period. And I know this is kind of distressing stuff to engage with. So you know, thank you for diving deep into this really important topic. Uh, to take a, a, I guess, a more optimistic spin on what has not been an optimistic time in terms of people's attitudes. There's a lot of change here, and to me, when I see change like this, I see potential that the change could have gone in a positive direction, and we could have, in fact, seen people engaging with the possibility of you know, real positive change. What what do you think the rhetoric would need to look like over the last year differently to see that, that change going in the opposite direction? Like to see people actually engage with the need for a different approach. Yeah. Um, I forgot to repeat the question. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, funnily enough, I have, uh, as you were noting, actually, a study where we looked at different messaging and the impact that had on people's decision to vote. And we're still unpacking that data because it's a bit messy and stuff like that. Um, but one of the things that did seem to work a little bit is having like um, a collective memory frame on the the way that the voice is positioned. So linking it back to things like intergenerational trauma, the impact of colonization, um, the need to um, like apologizing for the stolen generations and things like that. And so really grounding the referendum as a key part in Australia's history and making up for parts of that history as well. Um, and I didn't see a lot of that in the way that the voice was positioned. I was rereading the pamphlet yesterday just for some fun <laughs> Wednesday night reading, I don't know, for a, a, a study. And it's very now focused. It's very like politically focused and, and sort of, I think it was afraid to go too far into that kind of stuff to, to make people feel guilty and bring up people's backs. But I think this kind of research shows that potentially that was what was needed was, was more emotive language around the voice rather than just saying, we're all together and we need to make Australia better, actually diving into how it would make Australia better and why it's needed in the first place. I didn't see a lot of that in the way that it was talked about. Any questions online? Yeah. Um, would you be able to go back to your hierarchical question? So predicted fairness was whether it would actually create fairness successfully. Yeah. I'm curious as to how much overlap there is in predicted fairness annual next variable treatment of Indigenous Australians and how, like, whether, whether the data you've got can dive into why people thought it might be effective or not effective? Do they think it was because we don't need it or do they think it's because of the, the, the chaos and the, the lack of bipartisan support and the idea that, well, the governments fail time and time again, how is this going to make a difference? I wonder if there's a yeah curious as to what's driving that. Um so I'm not I like I haven't had a chance to look into that. We do have things like trusting government mm -hmm. um and that kind of thing that we can look at as potential, like how much that's related to this predicted fairness. I'm pretty sure as well, at least part of the data was collected before the Liberal Party took a stance and then afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the impact of that on some of the variables could be an interesting way to go. But it's very early days with this analysis. So but yeah, an excellent idea. We have one quick question. Oh, um, thank you for a great, great presentation. Um, a lot of what we see in, of the analysis in the sort of public media is around lines of education and jurisdiction, you know, being 
What can you tell us about that from your data or before? Alternatively, what are your plans to fix some of um, you know, that, that other, those other analyses that are out there? Yeah, so we do have um, education and things like that and fully plan to look at social class as well as a predictor of support. Um, so that hasn't happened yet, but definitely part of the plan for analysis. And we also, um, just before the voice referendum happened, collected another nationally representative longitudinal data set, the first wave of that. And that has even more questions around education. Um, there's some work out of the US to show that historical ignorance is a big predictor of um, support for these kind of, well, lack of support for these kind of things. Um, and so I developed my own like little history test to measure historical ignorance to see if like people not knowing about um, different parts of Australia's colonial history, about uh, different parts of the way the voice, uh, the, the like previous voices and things like that, like um, at sick and that kind of thing, if all of that can predict whether people support it or not, like an awareness of these kind of things. Um, so it's definitely something to, that we're going to look forward to in the future. And just one more from online. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I think this is a really relevant one. It comes from Amanda Winkett. Um, she asked, did you look at demographic data and whether there was a difference in the way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people voted versus other Australians? And do you have any thinking of why some Aboriginal people might have voted well? Hi, Amanda. Uh, <laughs> one time no see. Um, so we haven't looked at that in this data set yet, but um, we do have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sample that we can um, look at that. And I think it's very complicated um, why there was this sort of progressive no um, and lack of support from um, like Lydia Thor from the Black Sovereignty Movement and a few other areas. Um, I think part of it comes from um, what I mentioned earlier, which is this system of government has been forced upon us and then they want to include us in it and it's pushing back against that. I know a lot of Aboriginal people weren't happy with the fact that it was like predominantly non-Indigenous Australians deciding on this, this thing for us. And so um, I, I've even seen some confusing sentiment from people who, Aboriginal, um, like uh, people who are voting no, who have, now that the result has come out, are like, oh, of course, Australia would do this to us, that kind of thing. And so it was like, some Aboriginal people were voting no for their own personal stance, but really wanted a show of support from Australia to prove them wrong. Um, so it's it's very complex and complicated what's going on there. Um, and yeah, I think the majority of our data is non-Indigenous, so I don't want to read too much into ours about what was going on with them. Um, but excellent question. Right. Thanks so much. Oh, yes. All right. Um, so our next speakers are Professor Bruce Christensen and Associate Professor Anna Olson. Um, they're going to be sharing uh, their research with us titled A New Community and have you changed the title? No, it's still the same. A New Community and Research Enhanced Support, uh, A New Cares, a proposal for developing research-based specialty mental health clinics on campus. Um, and I'll just quickly introduce uh, both of our speakers properly. So Bruce is the Deputy Director and Head of Psychology in SMP. He previously served as the Associate Dean of Culture and Wellbeing uh, in the College of Health and Medicine as well. He is a clinical psychologist, neuropsychologist and cognitive neuropsychologist, neuroscientist with wide ranging interests in the causes and treatments of mental ill health. His research interests also include university student well-being, effective research supervision, community development, mental health systems, and the support of healthcare practitioners. And Anna is an associate professor of social foundations of medicine at SMP. Her interdisciplinary program of research combines practical and critical approaches to public health with a particular interest in marginalized populations uh, and qualitative methods. She values co uh, collaborative approaches to research and has extensive experience working with government and community on evaluation and research projects. Please welcome Bruce and Anne. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Joe. Nice to see so many people here today. Um, just before we get started, I want to uh, congratulate Olivia on her talk and on that research. I think it's super important. And I also know 
some of the barriers that you uh, faced in getting that off the ground. So congratulations, it was really more impressive. Um, so Anna and I are also delighted to be here and to be talking about um, some, a project of work that was supported by uh, the SNP grants that came from the Commonwealth government in and around COVID as a means for supporting research um, uh, through that period. And we were lucky enough to get one of those grants to support um, a, a piece of work that's maybe not um, conventionally um, research in the way that we think about it. It really is supporting a planning and development grant um, around a proposal for the ANU that we think um, very much would enhance uh, not only the research work, but some of the clinical work that goes on on, on campus and in particular to do with psychology. So Anna and I are gonna share uh, some of the presentation today. Um, Click on the screen. I'll click on the screen. Okay, great. Um, and I just will start by giving you a bit of the project context. So as I was alluding to, this project really motivated, I think, from what can be considered the sort of three-legged stool of clinical academic work, that of research, clinical service, and training. Um, but in particular, uh, the observations first of all, are that the ACT really has no clinical research capacity in mental health. We don't have any research training clinics that provide that sort of infrastructure uh, to enhance our understanding of mental health. Of course, there is a need uh, and a growing need to enhance mental health services. Um, the National Study of Mental Health and Wellbeing that we just conducted in 2022 suggests that about one in five Australians have mental health problems over the course of their life. But even more alarming is that since 2007, there's been a 13% increase in mental health problems in the population. And that there's certain parts of the population that are more vulnerable, uh, things like young people between the ages of 16 and 24, those that are unemployed, um, those that are incarcerated, um, LGBTQI uh, members of our, our community, homeless, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of emerging need for mental health services. There's also a need in that context to train more mental health professionals. Uh, the National Mental Health Workforce Strategy uh, 2021 to 2031 suggests that currently the federal government's only supporting about 35% of the workforce that's needed in psychology. And, you know, since the pandemic, this has even gotten worse. Before the pandemic, about one in a hundred psychologists had closed their books to do clients, and now it's a third of one in three psychologists. Underpinning all of this, though, is a, a growing realization that mental health services really need to meaningfully involve consumer input in order to make them relevant and impactful. And we will talk a little bit about this other sort of dimension of the proposed clinics, which is really as a source or an infrastructure to conduct a longitudinal study amongst um, university students about their well-being and mental health. So against that backdrop, um, Anna and I co-led this project. I also want to give a shout out to Aaron Parker, who was the postdoc on the project and did really all the heavy lifting. Um, but we assembled a large and diverse team. This is the project team from both within the ANU, across uh, UC, who's a partner in this, but also several individuals from the community. We organized that group into working groups, and each working group had a lead. This is a, an example of the working groups or the structure of the working groups, which met every three weeks over the course of the year of this planning and development grant. And we as a leadership team were able to attend about 90% of those meetings. So one of the things that we, um, was, we did was divide the project into several different uh, phases or components in order to inform what these types of clinics may or should look like in their construction architecture and, and function. So one of those things was a, a systematic review. Uh, the other was a, a pretty extensive consultation piece. Uh, then we did um, a, a conjoint survey. Um, and then we also uh, looked at other um, gray papers and, and government policies that could inform what we were doing. And so we'll sort of touch on all those briefly, just to give you a reflection of what we learned through that process. 
We did a systematic review. We were identified uh, from a from initial uh, location of 1,276 articles, 41 articles that really were giving us um, empirical information about what types of mental health models would be suitable for university-based clinics. And there really are two take-home messages from that systematic review. The first is that clinical service models that have embedded in them a um, stepped or matched care model that is trying to get the right treatment for the right people at the right time, um, show better clinical outcomes. Um, we also note that if that essential to the effectiveness of those types of models are really good um, uh, effective assessment and triage functions. And uh, later on, I'll tell you about how we've tried to incorporate that into the current student counseling and well-being services on campus. The second theme, though, is that consumer and community partnerships are essential. And um, there's lots of qualitative evidence that we uncovered for the benefits of co-design approaches and shared decision-making uh, approaches. But also out of this and the consultation work we did was a particular focus on something called a recovery college. And for those that may have not been exposed to recovery colleges, this is a, a concept or a program uh, sort of style that comes out of the UK, which um, really tries to place a greater agency and educational kinds of frameworks in the mental health uh, service world where um, consumers have more choice over the types of things they want to enroll in. Um, they also uh, have at their bedrock um, consumer involvement in the development and the implementation of those types of courses. So that was really something that was seen as beneficial. Um, is that you now? Yeah, it's me. yeah thank you. Thanks so much, Bruce. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to quickly take me through um, some of the other sort of scoping review work that we did. You know, a big part of research is not to try and reinvent the wheel. Um, and it is the case that there is a lot of uh, research out there, both nationally and locally, doing this kind of scoping review work around what we need in terms of mental health delivery um, across the nation and, and the ACT. So part of us collating that was just getting an understanding of not only what the research said in terms of developing services, but what is what a um, local scoping review say. Um, and of course, be no surprise, you know, a lot of what that work um, said was that um, um, you know, there are growing needs and not enough services. Um, we did do a lot of stakeholder consultation work. So, build, you know, building on this principle of um, doing some uh, co-design work with our ACT community, we started off by building a sort of bedrock of local knowledge around what, what's happening across the ACT. So um, did a lot of work, Erin um, and Bruce in particular, around meeting people um, across um, a really diverse group of um, service providers as well as government and um, key informants. So we met a lot of people across the ANU and UC as well as um, services and um, even some sort of similar institutes at, for example, the Brain and Mind Institute in Sydney to collect inf um, information around what's being done and what needs to be done. What did we find from that, you know, combination of, um, of grey literature and, uh, and speaking to uh, knowledge holders um, is no surprise to all of you, but mostly from psychology, <laughs> there are service gaps. Um, you know that um, that um, we need more service providers, um, and that we constantly heard the concept of um, the missing middle. So the idea that um, you know if you um, you know people with really severe um, mental health needs can can get some help, um, people with more moderate. Um, or, le or really less severe mental health problems have some access to resources, but it's really that sort of missing middle where um, we need more resources. Um, some specialised access, um, particularly for adults around um, uh, spectra around people on the spectrum. Uh, treatment for particular health problems, eating disorders came up a lot, um, and of course um, trauma and um, substance use. 
uh, psychiatry services. We have very few in, in the ACT. Um, there was a recovery college in the ACT um, and it was funded for a really short period of time. And despite the fact that it was quite successful on all accounts, um, it was defunded. So there was a real call um, across the ACT to refund that again. And holistic and person-centered services. Um, but there are structural issues. So whilst we do have services in the ACT, they're very fragmented and we hear the, the, this a lot in health, don't we? Um, there's limited availability availability, um, a dominance of private psychology, um, and particularly again for that sort of missing middle, limited services that are culturally safe and appropriate for people from diverse backgrounds. So we heard that in relation for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as well as migrants and refugees. Um, and just that the issue around it, um, attracting and retaining a high quality uh, workforce um, who didn't all go into the public sector. Um, these are the list of communities that, that came up in our consultations in the grey literature around um, particular areas of unmet need, which Bruce has already gone through. And particular, particularly to our campus, and that's something that's unique about this, this study, we're not talking about um, building a research clinic that is outward facing. We're talking about building a research clinic that is for our campus, as well as the broader um, Canberra uh, region. Um, and the needs that we have um, here on campus are more appointments and shorter wait times. We obviously have a fantastic counselling service here, but they're um, oversubscribed. Um, better access to um, uh, medical documentation, doc documentation. So, um, so a lot of that talked to the integration of services across campus so that students didn't have to tell the same story everywhere, um, that they could go to a GP or a counsellor or a psychologist and, um, and um, you know, have some links between their documentation as well as being able to um, receive documentation to help in their studies and life. Um, international students came up a lot, which would be no surprise to you. Um, that referral process um, and, you know, one of the ideas ideas that we had um, presented to us was to have a referral point where people would come in and be triaged and that was quite popular um, and of course the student input in, and voice in the creation of such a service if, if we were able to get it up. Bruce is this you now I think or is that or is that back to me? Oh, I think it's I think it's still yeah. me. Um, so in terms of research and training um, and the needs. So uh, again, this service um, has a real focus on um, providing, uh, you know, psychological services for the ACT region. But as a um, research institution, we're also interested in um, creating a service that can provide um, resources for you all, <laughs> particular in the in the psych discipline. Um, and we conducted formal interviews with uh, researchers and many of you are in the room or online, um, as well as people from um, Rain and Might, the other institutions, the other, um, uh, such as UNSW, um, as well as um, current clinical psych postgraduate students. Um, and what we found was that um, that there's limited capacity to conduct in particular that clinical trial research. So the effort that goes into building those clinical trials, recruiting um, could be resolved by having a clinic and you know, having a sort of um, ready-made um, uh, source of participants. Um, the need for more lived experience partnership in conducting research, research so being able to connect with um, people who identify as lived experience consumers in the community. Um, limited data for workforce planning. Um, so we definitely heard that, you know, that we, we know that we need more psychologists, but um, some, some of the fine print there um, and thinking about how we plan and evaluate um, for growing our local services um, and research training clinics. So um, just that ability to send our um, site graduates into a, a quality um, research training clinic um, is a currently a gap in the ACT um, because there's a limited capacity to grow our training programs um, and the training settings that our programs have um, are um, not necessarily that integrated. Um, and so um, having, for example, um, capacity to um, have training on campus, um, in particular training where we know there's lived experience workers integrated into the service would be of great benefit. So in the back of that consultation, we also wanted to undertake some specific work in terms of understanding uh, preferences for what clinics might look like and what features they should embody. 
And this work had uh, was a mixed methods uh, approach, but it had three discrete phases, a focus group, then a discrete uh, choice conjoint experiment, and then a deliberative workshop or a citizen's jury. And we'll just go through each of those briefly and what they, what they um, showed us. Um, so I wanna talk first about the discrete choice conjoint survey. If people are unfamiliar with those, it grows out of mathematical psychology, but has been broadly adopted in market research. And it's usually around how people make choices or what's important in driving choices uh, for consumers in terms of products or services. A typical sort of approach previously might be to think about giving people features of a service like how long in the wait time, what type of treatments do you get, what's the cost, et cetera, and have, those, have people rate those as how important they are to them on a Likert scale. So you might get something like this, wait times are you know, really important, 10 types of treatments are important, cost is important. And so what you can see here is what sometimes people refer to as a greedy bias. Um, everybody wants everything in all their products and services and it doesn't distinguish uh, very much these dimensions. And it doesn't really provide an experimental system for um, recapitulating trade-offs. And you know that's when we make choice, there's always trade-offs, you can't have everything. So how discrete choice uh, conjoint experiments help that is to make up hypothetical services or products made by those dimensions and have people make choices amongst them. So I could ask you, if service A had a six month wait list, you received individual therapy that didn't cost you anything versus service B, which is a one month wait list, only group therapy will cost you $200, which one would you choose? And by tracking those choices over a series of trials, you can use some really good um, statistical approaches like hierarchical bays to quantify the impact of each of those dimensions on people's preferences or choices. So we did a focus group that identified 16 dimensions that were important to consumers and others in terms of the types of services they might want. These are those dimensions. And then we performed a, a discrete conjoint survey, like I just said, amongst almost 400 people, half of which were uh, with lived experience from the community and half which were with lived experience from, the, from campus. And here's what we saw. We find that um, amongst the most important attributes of a service are its cost, the types of treatment, the wait times, and the least important are the types of health professionals, whether or not research is involved, and whether or not people with lived experience are involved in the governance. I've also showed you here um, the differences between community and student responders, and there's a couple of notable uh, statistically significant differences in how flexible the opening hours are. Community responders wanted more flexibility, Community responders uh, wanted individual treatment versus um, group treatment more, whereas students um, wanted uh, more uh, focus on the continuity of care that they would see the same professional over time and more um, in, uh, diversity and inclusiveness in their services. Thanks. It's really nice revisiting this process. Um, Bruce, Aaron, and I really nerded out. Um, you know, it's a very community-focused um, project that was very much based on consultation, but this little part of it, I think we really loved it because um, Bruce and Aaron got to nerd out on BCEs and I, I got to nerd out on my participatory approaches. And this is the component that I'm going to talk about. So we um, put together um, what's sometimes called a, a sort of a citizen's jury or a um, deliberative workshop. There's a, a few different ways to describe them. And, and basically we um, had the pleasure of spending two days in, um, in Canberra with a, a group of um, diverse people um, where um, we had um, um, information about um, the AC about mental health service needs, the ACT region, and, um, and other aspects of um, clinical delivery, as well as um, you know implementation of new services um, provided to the participants, um, and. Um, um, and we and, um, and and then we basically got them to deliberate on a couple of questions. Um, so we had 17 participants. There were um, students from ANU. We had some consumer reps. We had peer workers, clinicians, researchers, government staff, and ANU wellbeing staff. So a really diverse 
diverse group. Um, and when we look at these two projects together, the DCE and uh, Deliberative Workshop, um, you know, what, what excites me the most is you can see why it's worth um, mixing methodologies, basically. What, what you get when you get different um, projects together and, you know, we saw a lot of similarity. So it's a lot of clarity pointing towards what we should do, but also a little bit of local difference is what, where we largely got out of um, the local consultation and, and a little bit of workshop. So people um, don't want to pay much. Um, they don't want to wait for long to, to get into an appointment. Um, they want ev evidence-based clinical treatment services with psychologists, um, not necessarily with um, other practitioners. Um, they want staff with diverse backgrounds. So diversity was a big thing that came up. Um, consumer input and inclusion um, in Research was was very important. Um, that that kind of warm warm referrals and service integration came up a lot. So again, not having to tell your story a middle a million times or just getting a brochure, but actually being sent to somewhere that knows what you need um, and um, hours of operation. Um, but something that was a little bit different that we got from the um, participatory methodologies were that people were really keen on this idea of Recovery College, whether they'd been part of the Recovery College before or whether they were just learning about it. They thought it would be a, a great resource um, that ANU could deliver internally, but also to the wider community. Um, and the idea of consumer-driven governance was also um, much more popular when we talked to people than it was in the DCE. So all this has led us to propose a particular uh, series of clinics and types of service. So in the clinical services, we see it as having um, a specialty psychological assessment service, which has come up repeatedly is really necessary. Some uh, specialized psychological intervention clinics. Um, we think that those clinics should include some other disciplines, most notably psychiatry. That would constitute the clinical services that there would be a recovery service as well, which would incorporate a recovery college and that mental health peer work would sort of span across the clinical and recovery services. The specialty clinics that we're proposing um, on campus would be an anxiety and depression clinic, which would just be an expansion of our current psychology clinic, but added to that would be an eating disorders clinic, a child and family clinic, a substance use clinic, and a trauma clinic. We would see each of these clinics of having a clinical and an academic lead to ensure that integration, and that each clinic would have between two and four staff members of staffing. We've also worked very closely with um, the Central uh, Counseling and Wellbeing Team, um, and they have already started a central assessment and triage service with wellbeing um, staff who uh, act as the front door for all incoming uh, student referrals. And we'd see ANU CARES uh, slotting into that process and being at the more extreme end uh, in terms of intensity and long-term provision of services, whereas low intensity could be provided as it is now by student peers and education. And that middle intensity would be at the counseling center now. But there's already a system in place to make that triage and to have navigators help people land at that matched care location. Totally the wrong person to talk to you about economic and financial modeling. But anyway, I'll give it, I'll give it a shot. Um, we've we've actually collaborated, one of our collaborators is um, um, Associate Professor Raymond Liu from uh, the School of Finance, and he's done some really sort of fancy, fancy modeling for us, which we won't detail today, but um, just to let you know, you know, there is a strong um, um, backbone here to um, rationalize what it is that we're proposing. Um, we've estimated, um, well, Raymond's estimated, definitely not me, um, that um, providing a service like this would um, provide over 14,000 extra psych consults per year, which in a small place like Canberra is huge. Um, we'd be giving more, providing more psych placements. Um, there's a, also a potential for revenue for, for this service. So we're trying to propose a service that's not necessarily um, costing the ANU, but is, is hopefully cost neutral or even may even um, be, uh, in, you know, create, create some resourcing for, for the university. Um, of course, there's social and economic benefits to the wider ANU community. Um, 
we would hope that there is some contribution from the ANU um, and we estimate that maybe about 1.5 million a year from the ANU could allow the service to break even. Um, it would be a free for, a fee for service um, funding for psych sessions, um, but with partnership funding um, and um, funding from the ANU, um, you know, it could be a lower fee for service um, and also that we might be able to invest in it, something like a recovery college. Um, and of course, having a program like this um, where um, for the psych discipline in particular, you could run clinical trials out of, you could run research out of, the potential for research income would be greatly increased. Um, and finally, um, we won't be able to talk about this in any detail just because of time limitations, but another um, component that we're proposing is something we're calling the Campus Life Study, which is a longitudinal study of student well-being and mental health. Um, we think that that would be valuable for a number of reasons. Uh, University of Canberra is also uh, a key partner, is, as is the ACT Education Directorate. Um, so I won't go over some of these, but I, if anyone wants to talk about them to Anna and I, I would be happy to sort of um, embellish why we think that this is a really good opportunity on campus and what we could learn and how, not only what we could learn, but how we could um, provide this in a living lab uh, type of context, which would provide lots of input from students and collaboration and co-development with students so that it would improve uh, well-being on campus as well. So uh, take home messages from our presentation today. There are no integrated mental health research clinical training clinics in the ACT, and that limits our ability to cut, conduct cutting edge research at scale, uh, provide high quality and accessible care and train the necessary mental health workforce for the future. There's an increasing acknowledgement that consumers need to be involved in the development and governance of mental health services and research. This project embodies that. Uh, the proposed uh, service is founded on a number of different approaches, including um, reviews, consultation, um, surveys, uh, and economic and financial modeling. The proposed service promises to deliver uh, double the available on-campus met uh, mental health consults, double the number of students in the clinical psychology program, a dramatically greater research capacity, uh, this recovery college that we've talked about, uh, what, what might be a world first longitudinal study of Australian student mental health and well being, um, and then a, a, a number of shared decision making and governance mechanisms for consumers, and a platform uh, ultimately for mental health education, stigma reduction, and community engagement. And uh, finally, the project has already established uh, key working partnerships with um, government and uh, local community agencies. Thanks for your attention. Um, very impressive approach to making work. Um, I guess I was wondering, I noticed how you're talking about like matching um potential, I guess, clients or the students or community to like the correct mental health level. Mm -hmm. But I was I've heard talk about how certain like the match between a client and the therapist themselves might not always be perfect. And so I was wondering if you've given any have, have you given any consideration of like creating a system that allows for that kind of um process where like you know like either it's like a 15 minute consultation beforehand to see if it is a good fit mm -hmm. and like those types of processes instead of wasting too much time and all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a, we haven't given that a, a lot of thought. So I think that's a really good point. I think that within each clinic, there could probably be things that would evolve in that way. I think even in our current psychology clinic, there's some provision for getting to know the therapist before you commit to it. So I think that you're right. Those process elements are important, but the matching we're talking about here is really about intensity and about kind of um, reducing that sort of thing that people find themselves in of trying to traverse the system for a long time before you finally get uh, somebody addressing some of the issues that you're trying to deal with. I think one thing we, we also heard in the consultations, Bruce, was that having peer workers at the service could, could help some of that too. So it means that um, there would be an element of continuity for people if, for example, they went to, you know, they're with a student therapist who'd moved out of placement or they saw a therapist that wasn't quite the right match, they'd still have some continuity in care because there would be um, peers there that, that um, who are paid to be there and be 
be across the clients. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's one mechanism that we did think about. Yeah, great. Any other questions? Maybe one more question for the moment. Right. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry. Just um, picking up on something you noted and on the slide around um, consumer governance. Yes. Um, I'm curious how that discussion emerged in terms of people's understanding of what consumer governance is and then follow up, what would, what might that look like? And yes, excellent question. Um, and, and certainly I would say we haven't quite got there yet around what exactly um, the right model would be for the ANU. Um, when you look across the literature, um, when you look a, a lot across what um, our consultations and our research work showed us, there were differing ideas around that could what that could be. Um, there's some great great models in the literature that we came across that I think could really work here. Um, but then also, to be honest, when we were talking to in some of the consultations and delivery workshops, there wasn't necessarily a great understanding around what that means and how it would work. Um, and there was sometimes that desire, well, well actually, we just want experts um, to do that, um, you know, what, you know, what, what role would a consumer have and, you know, probably not there, but over there instead. So, you know, I think some, you know, some of that work, um, um, is progressed in the research world, but is not necessarily um, common practice in the real world yet. And, you know, perhaps, you know, this clinic could do some of that bridging. That's good to be asked. And um, with the, um, with the, that sort of explained a bit of the difference between the DCEs and the, the, the jury, um, citizen jury thing in terms of the, the latter and the presentations and that might have gotten from a better perspective. Is that... Is that I think you're spot on. What do you think? I think so. And the other thing to, to remember is that we were very lucky on the citizens jury to have members uh, and, and consumers from the uh, mental health consumer network. So that was a, a pretty sophisticated group of individuals who, who were there. And probably the wider DCCE uh, didn't have quite that sort of level maybe of insight always across all the participants. Um, please join us if you are able to at Badger for some drinks now if you're on campus um, and otherwise we'll see you next week. <laughs>